It's time, D-Heads. Disney Blue presents Disney On Demand. Every week, Disney Blue lets you relive the magic, the movies, and the memories with celebrity guests, the best of classic Disney, and breaking news on Disney's latest. So put on your ears and give it a little bibbidi-bobbidi-boo. Disney Blue's Disney On Demand is on the air. Now, here's your host, Jonathan Johnson. All right, all of you Disney fans, St. Patrick's Day is well behind us now, and you tuned in for another magical installment of Diz Radio and the Diz Radio Show, and this week for March 24th, 2022, show number 246, we're going back to the 70s, the 80s, yes, the best time in life as a Gen Xer myself, because we're going to have a Mouseketeer, somebody from the Facts of Life, Different Strokes, Three's Company, and so many other things, as we have Julie Pekarski stopping in here at the show. Now, Julie, you may know from the second incarnation of the all-new Mickey Mouse Club back from 1977. And Julie's going to be stopping in and talking about what it was like being a Mouseketeer, how it still affects her to this day, as well as being part of Facts of Life, working with Nicolas Cage, and many other things. It is a pleasure to have a Mouseketeer here on the show that was involved with something that uh, I guess I'll get a little bit more into later on in the show. In addition, no show would be complete without the D-Team, and even though Frank is down there at Walt Disney World having fun, wandering around, riding the rides, we're all here in the studio, so fear not, Frank, we hope you're having fun, but we do have Cody here who's going to be stopping in with his pick of the week. We have Dominic taking you through the grand winners and the best attractions and more from the Walt Disney World Resort, as well as we have Aaron dipping his hand in that virtual mailbag and answering all your questions in I Want to Know, and let's not forget Jeremy, who's putting on his short pants, and he's going to be delving into another Disney classic with Disney shorts. There is all kinds of fun on the horizon. I am excited to be back here this week. St. Patrick's Day is behind us, so the luck just keeps on flowing, and now we are that much closer to Easter. Yes, I love Easter, as many of you D-heads do know, but I won't get into that here. We're just kicking off the intro here this week at Diz Radio, and I am excited. I am ecstatic because we have Julie Vakarski here at the show. I am, I'm just really excited for this one. So all of you D-heads, with that said, I think it's time for me to stop rambling, kick off the show, get the fun rolling, get the match again. So let's officially kick off show number 246 for the week of March 24th, 2022. Envelope to Davis and Kirk. Write down that. I want to see a preview of some elements to be contained in Walt Disney Productions' new, first run, full color Mickey Mouse Club. Ever since the original Mickey Mouse Club returned to syndication, station managers and program decision makers all over the country have asked why not do a new color Mickey Mouse Club filled with more cartoons, contemporary music, exciting features, and a new cast of Mouseketeers. An all-family program that can run in access time as well as late afternoon. We're pleased to say that these comments, plus an overwhelming demand from the viewing public of all ages, 
with their suggestions as to various elements to be included in this new program, will now be fulfilled. The initial 130 half-hour programs currently in production will run Monday through Friday commencing January 17, 1977. Backed by the most complete promotional and merchandising efforts in the history of Walt Disney Productions, the new Mickey Mouse Club is the outstanding example of high-quality original programming that is recognized by television industry observers as significant, beneficial, wholesome, and, above all, the finest in family entertainment. It's new. It's now. It's what your audiences have been waiting for for a long, long time. Here's your host, Jonathan Johnson. I just wish I could forget the whole thing. You will, kid. You will. All right, all of you D-heads, so I hope you enjoyed the official kickoff for show number 246 for the week of March 24th, 2022, as we have all kinds of fun on the horizon. Yes, we're going to be spending some time with a Mouseketeer, somebody that knows a little bit about the facts of life and many other things, as we have Julie Pekarski stepping in here at the show, and I am excited for this one. I am a big Mouseketeer fan from all the generations of Mickey Mouse Club, which I will get into in a little bit, but... It is an exciting time because Julie's going to stop in. She's going to talk about what it was like being a Mouseketeer in the 70s, working on shows like The Facts of Life, what she's up to now, and how many of these classics that all of us grew up with are still impacting her today. I'm going to go down the rabbit hole of Mickey Mouse Club because let's not forget there is some great Mickey Mouse Club stuff out there. Of course, there's Walt Disney's original Mickey Mouse Club, Annette Funicello. You know, who could forget the classics, the original classic Mickey Mouse Club? Now, mind you, I'm not that old. I didn't grow up watching it in real time, of course, but I did grow up watching the reruns back when Disney Channel used to air Vault Disney, and they'd have all the classic, you know, great classic Disney shows. I wish they would do that. They don't even offer those on Disney+, Plus, but that's a whole nother conversation. They're just pretending anything that was pretty much isn't an animated feature just gets lost with the random Apple Dumpling Gang tossed in there on Disney+. Plus. But anyways... Then you had the second incarnation of the Mickey Mouse Club, the all-new Mickey Mouse Club from 1977. It only ran two seasons. It was different. It was hip at the time. As they would say, it's groovy, right? Come on. If we, if we all grew up watching the Brady Bunch, it was groovy, right? It was groovy and happening, and it was way out. But it was a good one as well. Then you also had the Mickey Mouse Club that I remember back from 1989, and that ran for a long time. Many people remember the later half, because you had Christina Aguilera, uh, you know, Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears. You know, I'm more of a fan of the original incarnation from 1989 with Chase and Hampton, Damon Pampolina, Tiffany Hale, you know, Albert Fields, and then they created the party. Oh, let's not forget Dee Dee in that mix as well, and you had Brandy and a variety of those Musketeers really set the tone for that third incarnation. Now you're wondering, a third incarnation? There was actually a fourth incarnation of the Mickey Mouse Club as well. This one was solely online. It was exclusively for social media, Instagram, quick things, and it was called Club Mickey Mouse. Um, they tried to change it up a little bit. It was very diverse, really diverse cast, as always with Mickey Mouse Club. But there was something missing from it. Uh, the theme song alone was very blah. Um, and I think it just didn't catch on because they were trying too hard to be different. Hopefully we'll see a fifth incarnation that goes back to more true of the 70s or 80s slash 90s Mickey Mouse Club. But fun story, since we're talking about the Mickey Mouse Club, one of the fun stories is back when the Mickey Mouse Club was debuting. Um, this is the 1989 Mickey Mouse Club. Previous to that, yes, I got my feet wet and I went and auditioned for the Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah, it was a, it was a brutal time. I don't consider myself a singer, a dancer, or anything special, but I went out there and I auditioned. I was like, I'm going to do this. My dad thought I was nuts. Some boy from the Midwest is going to try out for the Mickey Mouse Club. But you know what? The thing I have to say about my parents is they were always supportive in anything I wanted to do. Come on, you're talking to a guy that went to an art college. They truly were supportive if they let me do that. So, you know, I went out there, clearly didn't make it, uh, clearly was not a part of any of that. But it was a fun experience, and I watched that show religiously. You know, by the time it aired, I was 8th grade, 
and it didn't make a difference. I didn't care how old I was. I came home every day and I watched the Mickey Mouse Club. And I will say, I fell in love instantly with Tiffany Hale at the time. Um, she has recently passed away these last couple of months, and that is very sad situation as well. Missing one of those original members of that '89 crew and the group, the party. Um, so our condolences go out to her family for that. But. You know, it was one of those great experiences, going out, auditioning, having fun. And over the years, I've been able to speak with many Mouseketeers. A variety of Mouseketeers, the party's been on here, and now we have Julie Pekarski stopping in. So I truly do love the Mickey Mouse Club. No matter if it's the first, second, third, or fourth generation of the Mickey Mouse Club, there is something about Mickey Mouse Club that truly feels like Disney. Am I wrong? It, like, it really does make it feel like... It, Walt Disney's presence. I mean, what is Disney without the Mickey Mouse Club? I don't know. It, it's something I need to bring back. I mean, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse was okay. Don't get me wrong. It, it's a great little show, but of course, it's educating kids. Like, it's Mickey saying, can you find the number three? Or more likely, he'd be like, oh, can you find the number three? You know, it's like, okay, that's a little too much. But... I want a Mickey Mouse Club back because it truly feels like Walt Disney. That, along with TV specials, Sunday night movies, it's a new generation. You have to be open-minded, and I truly feel that we will see another incarnation of the Mickey Mouse Club. I do think it's going to be coming soon. Now, speaking back of the Mickey Mouse Club, uh, you know, I wasn't able to go see it in the 70s, of course, because I was like three. But uh, one of the things about the 70s Mickey Mouse Club that truly does ring out to me is when they went to River Country. Now, mind you, it's the Mouseketeers went to Walt Disney World. Now, that is one of the few specials you can still find on Disney+. Plus. If you search for it, you can find it. The thing that makes it fun is they go to River Country. And, you know, River Country, long gone. Uh, many of you younger D-heads out there only know River Country from people visiting the abandoned park. Um, climbing the ropes, filming the videos, what's going to happen to River Country. You've heard the rumors about it closed because of parasites or it closed because of this. And, you know, there's so many different things that have happened, urgent urban legends. But I grew up going to River Country, and I loved River Country. It had that Tom sawyer ass. Now, this is before you had Typhoon Lagoon. It's before you had, uh, you know, uh, Blizzard Beach, things like that. So the thing is, is I grew up wa going to River Country having fun, and seeing the Mouseketeers there, that song that they sing in that special, I still sing it to this day. And I'm curious. I'm going to ask Julie if she remembers this song. When she stops in later in the show, I'm going to ask her if she remembers the River Country song. That's going to be a must-ask. Now, the thing that's funny is even though it was a promotion for River Country, Walt Disney World, one of the first water parks that were themed and fun, the thing that's ironic about it is in 1989... The next generation of Mouseketeers did Ico Ico at Typhoon Lagoon. So here you have a brand new water park at Disney, opened in 1989 along with Hollywood Studios. Then it was MGM Studios, and they were singing Ico Ico. So who knows? Who knows? Maybe we'll have the next round of Mouseketeers launching when we get an all new water park as well, and they can promote that. But. There's just a lot of fun little things. Now, I know I'm just rambling, going in circles, but hopefully I'm sparking some memories and some magic or making you want to go back and watch some of these. But all the different guest days, the fun times, the, the variety show of Mouseketeers, it just made it fun. You never knew which guest of the, of the era was going to pop up or, or how many celebrities stopped in on any version of the Mickey Mouse Club that I was introduced to for the first time. I'm like, who's this old guy? And then I go back and watch their stuff, and I was amazed at what I was opened up to. Um, and that's much of what Diz Radio is. Sometimes there's music on here. You're like, ugh, I don't like that. Or there's classics or there's newer things. It's all over the board. But if you're a younger D-head, hopefully we're opening you up to some of those really old classics. You know, just really opening you up to something that's out there and different and beyond Dole Whips and Haunted Mansion. Um, and then for all of you uh, older D-heads, you may not like some of the newer tracks, but think of it this way as well. Think of all the new movies and things like that. If they're not retelling these stories, they're not going to get passed on. They might get lost. Or the Disney magic is still alive for another generation. I mean, there is four versions of Freaky Friday, all Disney made. Most people don't realize that. There's four. Four Disney versions of Freaky Friday. There's also three different versions of the Shaggy Dog. Uh, there's a lot of different variations out there. And look at it this way. They're remaking it so it can get passed on for another generation. Uh, it may not be your cup of coffee 
It may not be something you love, but think of it this way. It probably is something connecting to the next generation. And if it flops, if it fails, then they miss their mark. Do you know what happens then? Then everything goes back to everyone liking the original anyways. It's a hit or miss. So all of you D-heads, that's my ramblings, my talkings, my whatever here for this week. You can go ahead and you're screaming, telling me to shut up if you haven't fast forwarded already. So with that, I am excited. I'm ready to jump on in, talk with Julie here shortly here at the show. But before I do that, we got to release the reins here to the D-team. We have Aaron answering all your questions and I want to know. We have Jeremy, who might get a little crazy and a little mad for March Madness and Disney Shorts. And let's not forget Dominic, who's going to be talking about Walt Disney World attractions, the history, the best and worst of those attractions, and more. And Frank, you know, go out there, visit the Tiki Room maybe the Carousel of Progress, hit some of the really, really old ones so people can just sigh and look away as I'm saying them right now even. So all of you D-heads, let's press on, let's continue on for show number 246 for the week of March 24th. And when I'm back, I'm going to have none other than the beautiful, the talented, the classic Mouseketeer, Julie Pekarski here at the show.
Lights, camera, action. It's time for this week's Disney On Demand special guest. All right, all of you Disney fans, you tuned in for another magical installment of Diz Radio and the Diz Radio Show. And as we continue to bring you the magic and memories from your lifetime of Disney, whether that's growing up watching television, the wonderful world of Disney, sitting down watching sitcoms with your family, with us here this week is somebody that's no stranger to any of that. You know her from donning the mouse ears back in 1977 with the Mouseketeers. She's been part of the facts of life and so many other things. We have none other than Julie. Pekarski here. Welcome to Diz Radio. Oh, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's an honor to be here. I'm excited. It is our pleasure having you on. I mean, somebody, you know, big Disney fan myself. I love it. And I got to say, I'm sure I'll bring it up shortly. You know, of course, the Mouseketeers at Walt Disney World. But I guess what led you down the road of entertainment and things like that? Because I'm sure you were well into it well before you became a Mouseketeer. Well, okay, so in the sense of being chosen as a Musketeer, I was just turning 13. So I didn't have a lot of years ahead of me there. But um, basically, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. I love my Midwest values and growing up there. And um, it was myself and my sister, um, Jennifer, and my mom, you know, put us into dance classes. That's kind of what you did back then with girls. And so I was taking um, those classes and a mentor took me under her wing, felt like she saw some potential there, really wanted to work with me. And so I did singing, and I really um, I did singing and dancing. And then back in St. Louis, we have a wonderful theater called the Mini Opera. It's the nation's largest outdoor theater. And I had done some professional shows there. I also did count, talent contests. And back in the day, Jonathan pageants, but they weren't quite like they are known for today. It was pretty, you know, just your normal basic pageant. And I did things like that, and then eventually the auditions for the Mouseketeers came up, and my mentor had submitted my resume and pictures for that, and um, the rest is sort of history, as they say, went to Chicago to audition. <laughs> well, with that, too, I mean, I guess, what was your original thought? Because, you know, you had the Mouseketeers when Walt was alive, and then, of course, they're like, we're going to reboot this. We're going to get this going. Um, was it something where you were just, like, ecstatic, like, all right, I loved the Mouseketeers as well. I hope I get this role. Oh, yeah. I mean, most definitely, um, to be a part of that um, history, the, the 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 legacy of being involved with, you know, anything Disney is amazing. And um, I kind of knew of the Musketeers, the original Musketeers. I personally wasn't, you know, didn't watch it or didn't see reruns or anything like that. Um, and they said that this was going to be all new. You know, they were going to do color. Back then, all the special effects, you know, with having Mickey kind of talk to us, though he really wasn't there, that was all, you know, brand new stuff going on, not like what you have today. So it was amazing to be part of that. And then, of course, being able to sing and dance, which is what I so love doing, it was a dream come true. And with that, too, because like you said, it was special effects. It was something new and different. And, of course, you had Walt Disney World wasn't very old at that time. What was it like that first day you got on the set, you landed the role? Um, I guess, what was it like when they're like, these are your mouse ears, you are a mouseketeer? Oh, well, I mean, it's a moment you just don't forget. Um, I don't know if it really, to be honest with you, Jonathan, sucked sunk in at that age, you know, of being 13. <laughs> so, because the fun thing is, so I had never been on a plane at that time, and actually my mother, obviously being older, she actually had not either. So, I mean, the whole thing was just kind of an overwhelming, like, pinch me, is this really happening kind of thing. Um, and when you walk on this big sound stage, well, first of all, everyone was so warming. I mean, they really are. It was a wonderful, like, family atmosphere. And you walk on the set, and you're introduced to these other 11 kids that um, four of us were from out of town. The other eight were from L.A. And it's kind of like, this is like who you're going to be spending every day with for the next however long it was going to be for the show. And when you went on the soundstage, and actually to be honest with you, when we went in, they they screened uh, an animated movie for us. I, I, I wanted to, I think it was Snow White at the time. But we got to go into the movie theater that's there on the on the Walt Disney Studios lot. I think that's really when it hit me. Like you're walking in, you you see all the history. You go into the animation building. They took us on a big tour, and then at the end, when they, they like you said, you get to actually put on that first costume, and these are your ears. And like there is a spot, there is a slot in the dressing room that says Julie Mouseketeer Julie's costumes, wardrobes, uniform for the for the Monday, why we're when and how day, right, and all the different days. Um, 
yeah, it was very surreal. It was incredible. And like I said, I don't think it really, really sunk in until I got older. And then, Jonathan, definitely, definitely when you have your own children and you take them to Disney World or Disneyland. Um, oh, my gosh, I'm actually getting kind of emotional right now. Um, I think that's when you go back going, wow, how blessed I was to have that at that time in my life. Well, definitely. And it's like you said, it's one of those things where it may have not hit you at the time, but taking your kids back and sharing that, I mean, that's truly is the Disney magic right there. I'm the same way. When you share that with your children and you were part of it, it's one of those where you're just like, this is an amazing thing that is going to be passed down through throughout my family for eternity. Exactly. Exactly. And I have to tell you too, and I still obviously I get, um, I do get fan mail from like all over the, uh, all over the world, um, Spain, um, Belgium, Switzerland, Poland. And, um, actually it really humbles me. I don't know if for some people it might go to their head, but for me, it truly humbles me. I've gotten letters that people say, but you've touched my life. You don't know what it was like. I, you know, maybe they had some, some, you know, personal issues or different things growing up. And they said, I looked to you and your performance and your attitude and the way you, you know, lived your life. I mean, it is such a humbling experience. And um, I share that sometimes with my kids as they get older. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, believe it or not, it's a fan mail. They're like, really, mom? And then when they read the letter, I think, you know, that's a gift onto them to realize that, you know, you do make a difference in the world and how you lived your life. You know, right. You never know whose lives you're touching. And with those performances, being part of the Mouseketeers, I mean, that was a it's a moment in time. It's this capsule and looking back. And one of the things that I truly loved watching and I've rewatched it over and over again, I've showed my kids it actually and they enjoy it is the Mouseketeers at Walt Disney World, especially when you guys are singing the River Country song. What was it like filming at Walt Disney World during that time? Oh, my gosh. Well, what's really funny is, you know, there are certain things in your life you remember, you forget as you get older. I literally can sing those songs, river, country, big river, country, it's a hoot, it's a howler, it's a water timbre. I mean, how do I know those words? And yet I sometimes can't remember where I put my car keys. I don't know. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that was like, are you kidding me? Think about it, Jonathan. Oh, we're going to take you to Disneyland, you, um, Disney World. Do you think you can handle going there? Oh, let me see. Yes. And get to ride the rides and um, be a part of all that. Um, it, it was, it was, um, it was literally like living in a, a fantasy world and river country. It was amazing. I know looking back, a lot of people are like that whole segment we did was a big kind of, you know, a kind of a commercial to promote the different things that are going on in Disney world, but it didn't matter because it was all family oriented and we loved doing it. And again, it really wasn't work. I mean, you loved going every day to the set or to Disney World. And then, you know, we performed at Disney World as well. We were there for like three weeks doing um, summer shows there in the actual um, park on the small world stage. So that was really fun, and we did it at Easter time. But doing the wonderful world of Disney, I mean, there were different parts of it when I know we were like chasing Nito um, because she was lost in it. We were there, and the park was closed. So imagine going, and you can hear Snow White at the Wishing Well, right, doing her little singing because it is so quiet. There's nobody else in the park. I mean, what kid wouldn't want to have and be a part of that, right? <laughs> right. Well, you know, and it's and it's one of those things too, where, like you said, it's it's there's something magical about it. I mean, and singing songs like River Country. I mean, when you can go in your swimming suit and spend the day, and that's your job, you gotta love it. And my kids, they're like, Dad, you got to experience River Country. I wish it was still open so we could. Oh, oh, I know, I know. Well, I know. I guess you know. I always say, kind of, you know, you got to modernize and move on and make things a little bit bigger or better, so to speak, um, with doing that. But it was great because it was very, um, I don't want to say down to earth, woodsy, outdoorsy. Um, you know, saying not quite so slick as it is now, but that's okay. You know, the different, um, the different water parks that they have, and then doing actually that whole show was great. Uh, just. Um, doing the Contemporary Hotel, the monorail, um, and getting kind of have the run of the park and everything. You know, what's an interesting thing, Jonathan, is they had at that time just the four main hotels there. But because we were coming in, they figured that the public would know or assume that the Mouseketeers were staying at those four hotels. So instead, we stayed out at what was called Buena Vista Lake. And that's where we stayed in one of the hotels out there because they thought that way, 
people maybe wouldn't find us that much and we would have a little bit more privacy. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's one of those they wanted to, you know, make sure that you guys weren't getting bombarded. And with that, too, because you have a, a, a kid fan base, right? Your peers, people are watching it. What day of the week, what theme was your truly favorite to film? Oh, geez. Um, okay. Loaded question. I, I, it is. I mean, I love them all because they all were so unique in different ways. But I think I, I actually am going to have to say Friday Showtime because I love that we got to have the guests come on. You know, we actually got to be with other people. And a lot of them had were, you know, that's actually what I thought. When I had auditioned, I thought, oh, please, just let me be an honorary musketeer and get to be on, you know, that one-time guest spot. So I knew that feeling that a lot of those um, kids that auditioned, I think they were, I mean, you know, runners-up were being contenders for the musketeers. So I just loved meeting all of them being at Disneyland, you got to be out in the public. And I think that kind of stems from my, my childhood, my um, growing up with, you know, live theater and performing, getting the actual response of people when you did something and get to intermingle with them and, and meet and greet them. So I think filming that at Disneyland and then doing the lot, you know, those shows where the, they would come to the Carnation Garden, which is actually not really there anymore. It's kind of adapted into a different I think is it one of where the at least at Disneyland it's a princess meet and greet I think, um, but yeah I have to say probably Showtime on Fridays was the fun. Well, you know, and it's it's one of those where it seems like it's the most fun. And with that too, there was also an LP and things like that. Do you have copies or any memorabilia that you've kept from all these years from your time as a Musketeer? Oh my goodness, yes, I I do. A couple of things like I wish we were allowed to keep. We wouldn't like, and we we don't get to have really our actual ears or any of those costumes per se. They're actually down in the archives. And I went um, about a year ago, kind of went in there to visit and see everything. And I was in the archives, and she's like, yeah, we have, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, yes, I have lunch boxes, I have the album, I have coloring books and puzzles, and the little, uh, they're the golden reader books. And what was great, Jonathan, is so as my, my kids were growing up, I didn't let them color in the coloring books, but I did, like, copy all pictures, and, like, I read to them. And it would say, Mouseketeer, Julie said, and I would read the stories. And then I was saying, you know, that's your mom. So that was kind of crazy. And for whatever reason, I ended up keeping, like, three complete sets of everything. And I have three <laughs> kids. So I, I have each of those saved. And my mom was wonderful with saving things. So I have these mouse, um, Mickey Mouse Club bar stools. So my basement in my house in St. Louis, I did it all in black and white and red. And it was because of the whole Mouseketeer thing. And those stools is kind of what set that all off. Oh, no, no. And John, I also have what I came across, and I'm actually trying to get them um, changed over to, I guess, you know, digitizing is the audio tapes. When we had to learn new songs and new, um, the different songs that had to harmonize and the words, we were given, you know, yes, cassette tapes back in the day, cassette tapes that they would, we would listen to, and then we would go in and record different songs. So I have all those. I do have some of the original sheet music. Oh, I have some of the original sheet music from the Sherman Brothers, right, that wrote on Mary Poppins. That was an amazing experience. So I have some of that. But I'm trying to digitize some of those audio tapes just to have because I know they're deteriorating. Well, and those are gems that your children are going to love as well, as, as well as you looking back. I mean, something from, the you know, having the Sherman Brothers and things like that that you've been able to – interact with i mean it is it's timeless i mean and i can tell that you are still truly fond of all of these experiences oh are you kidding? yes yes um and some of our costumes um well and then we actually had like annette Funicello and um tim and different um past musketeers on the show with us that was a wonderful experience they were guests you know guest stars but a couple of the costumes i'll never forget one was the mary poppins it was Julie Andrews' actual dress that she wore in um, Jolly Holiday because we were doing a spoof with Step in Time and some different, what they called Musketeer talent. They would have Musketeer talent different times of the week. And you'd get that costume and then you would see names in it, Julie Andrews or different things. It was mind-blowing, mind-blowing. Well, you know, and with that too then, so the Musketeers, huge. I could talk Musketeers till the end of time, but also... 
that that shifts into the facts of life, though. I mean, come on. The facts of life is a classic among itself. What was it like being part of that? I mean, of course, you know, you were part of that original I- inception of facts of life. And the theme song sticks with everybody. What is it like looking back, knowing that there's this huge 80s revival all the time, I feel. And people, you hum that song. It doesn't make a difference if it's a Generation Z child. They know that song. Oh, exactly. Um, no, that was, that was wonderful. Um, because I was roughly around the age, give or take maybe one or two years older than what they were actually writing the script for, you know? So you're kind of living out what you were actually going through in life. Um, I have great memories. Um, the way we did so sitcoms back in that day, we would rehearse for four days and then on the fifth day you do a dress rehearsal and then later that day you shot two um, shows in front of a live audience, two different audiences. And as a, again, that's when, like, I loved it. It came to life. It was amazing. It was wonderful. Now, both with Mickey Mouse a Club and with Facts of Life, you know, you're still in school. So the rules are, the laws are, you have to go to school at least three hours a day. So that was really interesting with all of us girls, you know, we, and we were all, um, I'm trying to think, I think three of us, Lisa, uh, Felice Schachter, and my we were all, and probably Julian Haddock, we were all in the same grade level, I believe. But then you had Kim and Mindy and Molly. They were on, on, on different a clubs. But, you know, we had to have time for school. And we actually hung out even when we weren't doing the show. I mean, we really became like a group of sisters. And, 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 and it was really wonderful. And Charlotte Ray was truly an amazing gift. Um, kind of the, the mother on the set. She looked out for us girls. Um, taught us a lot, taught us to speak up about things and, and also about acting. I mean, what a gem in regards to that. And, um, I mean, I really truly only have great memories. I know some people talk about, okay, your costumes and wearing some short shorts and things like that, but, <laughs> you, but you know, I, I just, I never, I personally never felt anything that was being exploited, you know, or things like that, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, looking back, you know, I guess certain things were chosen for certain reasons, but I never had any of those kind of feelings. And I actually, I'm glad that I still keep in touch with girls. Lisa and I are in touch um, with, I think we've kind of gone through things the same in, in life with marriage and kids and um, she has grandkids. And now I have my first granddaughter, so I'm so excited about that. And um, Kim Fields, Tootie, she lives um, in Atlanta part-time, and my daughter was in school at Emory, so it was hysterical. My daughter babysat. For her kids, that was, I'm like, wait a minute, what? Back to life, my daughter's babysitting your kids. Are we that old? Um, and Mindy, too, Natalie. Nancy, I haven't really gotten to um, speak to too much or see her as much, um, but Mindy as well. Um, we stayed in touch, and just, um, it was really great, and I think it was groundbreaking at that time, Jonathan. The, um, you know, that type of show. And having, you know, that many girls and being leads and getting to speak into those parts. And, again, the fan mail that I get, um, because there was a lot of shows in that first episode, five or six of them, that Sue Ann was a leading main character in those shows. So I am proud, definitely proud of those moments for sure. Well, and like you said, too, you know, with, the, I guess, the clothing, the style changes, it's just, it was the sign of the times. And still getting fan mail. Now, I do have to say – all right, you know, you were all around the same age, you went to school, you hung out. How much hijinks happened when the cameras were off? And do you have anything that you could possibly share that's not too damaging of a fun moment of that? Oh, I mean, yes, we did. I'm not going to say we really did prank too much, but um, we had a ton of fun. So where did our, we were set up at that time, um, down the hall from us, different strokes of scene filmed. So we always had, I, I always remember little Gary Coleman, which, see, what happened is you kind of forgot how old he was, you know, um, um, due to his, um, you know, with his illness and different challenges there. But he would come up, and the way he would, he would kind of, like, take his little fingers and go kind of across the back of your legs wearing the shorts, and I'd go, mm, Gary, you know, and he'd be, what you talking about? You know, and just, I remember cute fun <laughs> things like that. And one day at a time was also being filmed down because we were all in that same, um, in that same production company in that, that house, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, warehouse that we were being filmed at the studio there. Um, as far as the girls, um, 
I'm trying to think. I mean, I think it was interesting with, we would, you know, different costumes and who's wearing what and what costume are you wearing and if you liked it or you didn't like it and some hairstyles going on. And I do think there was a lot of us, we'd have our makeup done and then sometimes we'd go and put just a little bit more mascara on or a little bit more lip gloss on just because, we, you know, we felt like we wanted a little bit more and um, and then makeup would come back and go, um, did you guys apply more? you know, rouge and things. We'd be like, who, us? Did we do this? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, and I was just going to say, and the only thing I could think of is when we hung out, I remember doing the whole roller skating thing. So we did do roller skating. It wasn't really rollerblading at the time. And I remember having my skates and having, like, the disco wheels. Oh, I'm so dating myself. And we would hang out and go do that. And at that time, our group was kind of that same group. It was the Rob Lowe's of the group. And the Peter Barton, that was kind of all our age range at the time. And um, I'm sure, you know, we had some discussions about different boys and different guys we kind of liked and who might want to claim who. <laughs> so, you know, as uh, I guess with that too then, you know, because you were in all these different, I guess, th- these series and things that have been passed on to generations. I mean, they have been around and just keep getting passed down. I mean, it's one of those little nuggets in time where, you know, it's just, they just keep showing up. Every few years, they show up again and again and again. I guess is, you know, either of those, whether they come back with a fifth incarnation of Mouseketeers and want to invite you back or a Facts of Life reunion or reboot, are these things where you're like, yes, sign me up. I will, I will be part of it in some way, shape or form. Oh, are you kidding me? Most definitely. Um, hello, Jonathan. The 100 year anniversary is coming up. I am like, sign me up. I would so love to be a part of that. Most definitely. I mean, that changed my life. So I, yes, I would, I would love to do that. Sign me up for that. And of course, that's a life reunion. Yes. Um, well, actually, I'm getting together probably. I'm actually, while I'm, I'm here, I'm living in California. I'm trying to get together with a couple of the Musketeers just just as a fun get together, it's not like a publicity thing. We just want to catch up and um, meet up with each other. Um, but if they do the Fast Girls Live reunion, most definitely. And l- let me tell you, if they do a reboot, I have a great idea, Jonathan. I have a great idea that I'm thinking Sue Ann, because of the way her character was, would come back as the house mom in a sorority. And then she's single, and it's like, Who's teaching who and who's guiding who? If Sue Ann needs to go out on a date and the girls would say, oh, no, no, this is what you have to wear or swipe left, swipe right, you know? And yet Sue Ann would be helping the other girls in the sorority. Yeah, I got some ideas for sure, Jonathan. <laughs> See, you need to be out there pitching some of this so we can get some something good on uh, on TV. Definitely, yeah. I'm thinking, definitely. I'll have to, I have to think about that. Get get some networking going for sure. Now there was a, another thing that I had to bring up because it's it, it never made it past the pilot, but the best of times and with Crispin Glover, Nicolas Cage, things like that. You know, it never got picked up to series, but that debut episode, fifty minutes, it looked like a blast. Uh, what was it like working on that? And you know, was everybody just really hoping that this thing got picked up? Okay, well, so I've always been so blessed because, um, you know, when the Facts of Life kind of, you know, went a different path and let some of the girls go, I actually had this pilot waiting. So it was wonderful. And see, I got to sing and dance again. Oh, no, what you see, it was fun. It was awesome. Got along with everybody. It's so funny because of Nicholas Cage being on it. It was like before he, you know, did his breakouts. It was so funny, but he was great to work with. And um, I think... Yes, everybody was really hoping. And if you look back at the timing of it, Jonathan, I really believe it was just too soon. Because look how many years later, then you had High School Musical come out, right? And and and, and the, the, the more genre with incorporating the musical theater and things like that into things. I just feel like this variety was, it was, it was just a little bit ahead of its time um, doing that. I actually, and I'm really dating myself, I loved watching the Carol Burnett show and the variety hours and doing those kind of things. And I really feel like that's how that best of times was supposed to be. Almost like a Saturday Night Live, you know, that kind of an idea with skits and things, but for that teenage generation, if that makes sense. Right. It was definitely, you know, it's one of those where the lightning was going to strike. It just, it was too ahead of its time because shortly after, like you said, there were a lot of those uh, kid variety shows, high school musical, things like that, that came into place. It was more... You know, you just just had to wait a little bit longer to release that, and maybe it would have taken off. 
I know. I, I def, definitely. But Kristen Glover, I mean, seriously, all the people on that show, oh, we had a blast. Everyone was pretty, I think, confident and secure, and everybody, you know, kind of like there was no competition, if I can explain it that way. Everybody was very encouraging, helping each other, working with each other, and I've been very lucky in all the things I've worked on, Jonathan, that I loved going to work every day. It wasn't work. Let's put it that way. It wasn't work. Well, and I think that's when you found that, uh, you know, that, that genie in the bottle. When you're going to work, you're smiling, you're having fun. And it doesn't feel like work. You've achieved something. And in your case, you've also achieved that magic from the genie in the bottle because here it is years later and we're here talking about it. Exactly. Yes. And I, again, I said, I'm very lucky in being a part of the Disney family and doing that, that um, it is, it's very special. It is very magical. Now, I guess, you know, we don't want to keep you too long, but so many different things going on, um, you know. From everything from the Mouseketeers to Facts of Life, other shows that you've been on, like Three's Company, Different Strokes, you know, so many different things. I guess for all of the people listening in, all the fans whose lives you've touched, people you don't even know whose lives you've touched, they've grown up watching you, they still enjoy it. Are there any final words you'd like to leave out there for all of those tuning in? Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say from the, oh, I'm going to get emotional, from the bottom of my heart. Um, I thank you all because to be honest with you, to get to do what I do, what, what people do in the entertainment industry, um, my youngest who he's actually on Broadway and I remind him every day you go on and perform, that person is watching it for the first time, you give it your all and you wouldn't have a job. You know, I, I wouldn't have had a job unless it was for people that loved our show, wrote in, supported it, the fans. So, um, seriously, you are, a plus number one in my book for that. So I can't thank you enough for that. Um, in the sense of a personal level, for all of you that are out there, just remember to stay true to who you are. Um, don't compromise your beliefs because through all of this, I have, you know, kept who I am and what I believe in. My faith is important to me. And, and I just stay true to who you are. Don't give in um, or cave. And um, go for it. My mom would always just say, um, she's, you know, has passed now, but would always say, you know, just go for it. Don't let someone take away your joy in life. And, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. And I appreciate all the letters and um, the support you've given me. It's very, very humbling. And um, you're welcome to follow me on um, actually my Instagram account and um, Jonathan, right now, what I'm really hoping to do and I would really love to do is um, I'm trying to get on Dancing with the Stars, actually, because they've never had a Mouseketeer. So what do you think about that? You know, I think that would be ideal. If they've never had a Mouseketeer, I think it is the time where, you know, I, I've said this phrase before, lightning is going to strike. And I think this is the time for you to do it. I think you need to get out there, dance your heart away. And I think everyone would be cheering on Mouseketeer Julie. Oh, oh, thank you so much. That That means the world to me means the world to me. You know, it was our pleasure having you stop in, take this trip down memory lane, have some fun. I mean, like I said, you know, I've passed on everything to my children as well. So they're very familiar with you as well. So it has been a pleasure stopping in, chatting with us and, you know, just taking these moments because you've played a part in everyone's lives and, and passed it on to everyone else and kept it magical. So thank you once again. And maybe we'll be turning that channel and seeing a Facts of Life reboot with you involved or Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> that would be Absolutely amazing. Another new chapter for sure. And Jonathan, thank you for having this type of um, medium to speak to people and you yourself keeping the magic alive and keeping it going. You know, thank you for doing that as well, Jonathan. <laughs>